be with you like a forever chemical. I wanna be with you like a forever chemical. I'm Dr. Craig Butts, and I'm a staff application scientist with SciX, and welcome to another episode of Dr. Craig's PFAS Fireside Chats. So it's been about 20 years since scientists first detected PFAS in humans in the environment. And initially our studies targeted uh, mostly the eight carbon length perfluorinated carboxylic and sulfonic acids, such as PFAS and PFOA. And although our monitoring lists have expanded since that time to include some of the replacement compounds, such as Gen X, those lists are ultimately small compared to the estimated 5,000 PFAS compounds that are used in commerce. So this, of course, begs the question, what other PFAS are out there in the environment? And could humans and, and uh, wildlife be potentially exposed to these novel PFAS? Well, my next guest set out to answer those questions with his team and discover a few su surprises along the way. Dr. John Washington is a research chemist at the EPA's Office of Research and Development in Athens, Georgia. Uh, and he's here today to talk about his paper in science. So, John, welcome to the show. Thank you, Craig. Thanks. So just to start off, um, as I uh, alluded to in the preamble, you found some surprises in your study, um, you know, looking at the soils and vegetation around New Jersey. And so maybe you can just start off kind of high level, describe some of your uh, main findings. Well, sure. Um, in, our, in our study, the New Jersey DEP collaborated with us to collect samples from around the state. And they were concerned about just in general, uh, PFAS that might be in the uh, environment of the state of New Jersey with all their industries, uh, including two in particular, uh, uh, areas near Salve uh, Corporation and uh, Kemwars, and both in South Jersey. And uh, so they sent uh, soil and vegetation samples to us here, our lab here in Athens, Georgia. And we ran targeted and then non-targeted uh, analyses on these samples. And we were surprised in our uh, non-target analysis to find a suite, a family of uh, PFAS congeners uh, that we were not expecting to have found. The, they're chloro, perfluoro, polyether, carboxylates. And we found about nine of them, 10 of them oh. maybe. Okay, interesting, yeah. So these, uh, these 10 compounds uh, based in a family of uh, chloroether carboxylic acids. Um, I, I think most listeners on the show may not be familiar with their structure. Um, you know, a lot of folks are just um, probably familiar with the standard perfluorinated carboxylic and sulfonic acids. And so, um, you know, structurally, how do those um, differ or really, or are they um, similar to, to right. PFAS and PFOA? Well, they're fairly similar. They just have a few additional moieties added on. Uh, so if we follow the name of uh, chloro per fluoro, uh, on one end of the molecule, it starts with uh, three carbons that are saturated with fluorines, except for one of the fluorines has a chlorine instead of a fluorine. And then uh, the chain is broken at the three carbon length by an oxygen, which would be one of the ethers. And then after that, uh, there's variation among the 10 members of the family that we saw uh, of, of having either two carbon groups per fluoroethyls or three carbon groups per fluoropropyls. And these are divided uh, from the other sections of two and three carbons with these ether linkages, the oxygens. And then it terminates on the other end with a carboxylic acid. Okay, yeah, I interesting. Um, so, so still kind of forming that, that base skeleton of highly fluorinated uh, yes. alkyl and uh, a, um, acid functional group. Um, That's right. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And also interesting too, you, you mentioned um, that, you know, you found a family of these, right? And so that's, yeah. that seems consistent too with a lot of PFAS where you have, um, you, you know, many different uh, congeners or um, a homologous series. Um, and now these spatial trends that you found in the New Jersey soils, um, can you just kind of roughly describe those in, in terms of sure. what you saw? So for the, uh, the chloro per fluoro polyether carboxylates, uh, which are quite unique, uh, we found very clear uh, spatial trends for the eight major congeners, 
two of them were to, like we detected just above our detection limits and it was really not a large enough data set uh, for us to see spatial trends. But for the eight larger, more concentrated uh, congeners, we were able to find uh, very clear, highly statistically significant spatial trends uh, with respect to the distance from Salve, the manufacturing facility. Uh, highest concentrations near the site, near Salve, and the lowest concentrations and fewer detections of, of the eight congeners, the 10 congeners, far away from the site as well. Wow. Yeah, so um, the spatial trends really focusing in on on the presumed source of the, the compounds in the soil. Yes, yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. So these um, chloro uh, ether carboxylic acids, do we have any sense for what they're being used for industrially? Sure. Uh, yeah, they're, they're being used as processing aids uh, for PTFE, uh, which is Salve is manufacturing and distributing as a product. And... Uh, Previously, Salve had been using Surflon, uh, which is a mix of three odd numbered perfluorocarboxylic acids, the C9, the C11, and the C13. And this replaced uh, that Surflon as a processing agent in their industrial process. Oh, interesting. Yeah, because I, I remember hearing um, about Camours using uh, Pafoa as a processing aid. Yes. Um, I guess, yeah, Solvay would have used these um, C9, 11, and, and 13 uh, as their processing aids. That's true. But, um, yeah, it's, I, I guess you found out what their replacement compound is then. Yes, yes, we yeah. did. So, um, if I could now, I just want to touch in on some of the analytical methods you used. Um, you, you, know, you mentioned the targeted analysis, but you also moved away uh, from that and used uh, some of the novel non-targeted methods. Um, so what additional advantages did you get from using a non-targeted approach? Well, with a non, I mean, ultimately, in the end, uh, as we've gone over here, we wouldn't have known about these chloroperfluoropolyes or carboxylates had we not used a non-targeted approach. And what we had done there is we uh, ran, uh, we, first off, what I did was we uh, injected uh, all the extracts of all the samples, all the soil samples that were sent to us. And I selected the uh, three to five samples that were highest concentrations on the targeted analytes, uh, and then used those to inject on our, our uh, LC quadruple time of flight mass spectrometer and do non-target on those. Once we did that, uh, we compared the uh, results to online and in-house libraries, not identifying a lot. And so the next step that we did was uh, develop uh, Kendrick diagrams where we look at mass defect versus uh, total, total mass or against dilution time. And found, uh, I'd say at that point, the early in the uh, effort, I think we found three uh, peaks that seem to have uh, a periodicity of either two or three carbon fluorinated carbons off from each other that led us to suspect that we ought to look at those in more detail and when we did so we uh, found these probable uh, perfluorinated compounds and so I looked at them in, under with high collision energy and found a, a recurring fragment um, uh, reflective of the uh, three carbons plus an oxygen uh, mass. And so uh, I shot uh, or the samples again, but doing only high energy and looked for those and other fragments that are typical for perfluorinated compounds. And instead of having just two or three peaks that came up through time, uh, which we identified with a Kendrick diagram, we found numerous additional ones. And so then we inspected each of those in more detail and found this entire family. And oh, we right. not have been able to do any of this with targeted analysis. Yeah, no, re really interesting detective work, but also the iterative work, right? So, you, you know, using uh, something like the mass defects uh, mm -hmm. to kind of give you a hint of what was there. Um, and then, yeah, the common 
finding that common fragment and then interrogating the data uh, yes. again to see what else had that common fragment over and over again. And then the chlorinated signature too, right? And and, and you know, we're always used to fully fluorinated compounds, yes. right? But but you, you the compounds you found had that single chlorine on them. That was very diagnostic, yeah, with the uh, the chlorines uh, for a single chlorine being uh, the, the lighter uh, isotope being around three times, threefold that of the heavier isotope. It just jumped right out in the spectra yeah. very conveniently for us, uh, so that's nice. And right now, what we're looking at, uh, research being led by uh, our postdoc and soon to be permanent uh, researcher here at EPA, Dr. Marina Ivich, we're looking at uh, transformation at that chlorine site uh, in the, under environmental conditions. And we believe we probably have about three generations of transformation products occurring wow. starting at that site. Wow, uh, that, that sounds like you've got a whole other paper that's worth of data. Well, that's what we're working on. Yeah, great. So in light of those findings, um, I mean, what do you suggest for other analytical chemists um, in North America and around the world? Do you, do you think that they should start incorporating um, these compounds into their targeted analysis? Well, I, I think it I think it is worth a check. Yes. Um, the extent to which these are distributed elsewhere, I think, remains uncertain. You know, uh, a concern that I have uh, in this case uh, and others as well is that we've identified PFAS at the ultimate manufacturer or use site for many different PFAS at this point in time. But these primary producers and primary users distribute their products to other secondary commercial users and industrial users. Uh, and the extent to which these PFAS contaminants that we see around the source locations might be distributed at these secondary users, I think is ill-defined. And so really, I do think it's probably worth including these uh, in scoping uh, studies uh, at other locations as well. Well, uh, thanks so much, uh, John. I mean, really uh, interesting and um, you know, creative detective approach you took to uh, discovering these new PFAS. Um, and, you know, as we said at the beginning, uh, our monitoring lists are continuing to expand, um, and here's probably one more for the list. That's so right. um, thanks so much for your study. Looking forward to seeing those follow-up studies, um, and thanks for your time today. Thank you very much, Clay. Craig, I appreciate it a lot. I want to be with you like a forever chemical.